keep giving. Well, one reason, according to the Assemblies of God, between 2006 and 2015, a new believer was added every 29 seconds around the world. 95% um, of people who attend an Assemblies of God church live outside of the U.S. Every 43 minutes, there's a new minister of the gospel in the Assemblies of God. And every 63 minutes, a new church is planted. That's pretty awesome. Amen. I think we can give God a hand clap for that, right? Now, um, obviously God can do all that without us, but he's asked us to be a part of it, and it gets done with our giving, and so that's why we want to be a church that is generous and faithful, and so whatever um, promise you've made or whatever pact you've made with God, we just ask you to keep um, giving to that, knowing that God is faithful. He'll bless you, and then we get to be a part of this, and that's only the assemblies of God. He's doing many awesome things outside the AG. But even those stats right there, every 30 seconds a new believer on earth is added. That's really cool to hear. Amen. Let's pray together this morning. God, thank you so much for all that you were doing inside the AG and outside the AG. You are a big and mighty God. And so often we only hear all the negative statistics of what's happening to youth or the inner city or this or that. But God, we can see that you are on the move, Lord, every 30 seconds. And that's just within the assemblies of God someone is finding you. Lord, and, and every 45 minutes you're calling a new minister. Every hour you're planting a new church. Um, and we just thank you, God. And we ask that you would receive what we give this morning for your kingdom, that you would multiply it to meet needs here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. He has been serving Christ so passionately uh, the last 25 months. Um, just yesterday... Um, we had an amazing visit with him, and that's why we didn't get to go to Spencer's birthday party, but we got Spencer a gift, and we it's still not wrapped. It's, it, I thought it was in my office. It's not wrapped, but anyway, we're going to get it to you guys. No Cowboys. No, no, no it's, it's not Dallas Cowboys, believe it or not. No Steelers. Um, back to my story, see. Um, we had an amazing visit. It truly was a great family reunion. Um, Zach and Nick, um, you know, for the next three years not being able really to see each other unless special circumstances happen where it happens more often than we think. And uh, of course, Andy and Tiffany and the girls uh, is just very, very special. By the way, I said we have two Andys on the front row. We also have two Tiffany's on the front row. Isn't that crazy, you guys? Um, but um, Zach was telling us yesterday how the devil has just been kicking, screaming, fighting, trying to keep guys from being baptized in water. Um, he had a special sermon plan to teach. He, he does a Bible study uh, each week. They've got about a dozen guys that come. It just seemed like every time they planned to do the water baptism, it got stymied and stopped. And um, even it was supposed to happen this last Monday, and there was an unforeseen lockdown where just the prison went on lockdown, so it didn't happen. But this morning, six guys got baptized. Oh, the, the first one uh, is, is Zach. He got re-baptized since he, he said, I haven't done it since I made my recommitment, and he was re-baptized. Zach led a guy named Edgar to Jesus. Edgar uh, was a heroin addict for 15 years. God miraculously delivered Edgar. Um, he, in prison, he's called a big homie. That means, that means he's a boss. He was over all of the Hispanics. He had people paying him $500 a month to offer drugs. God delivered him from drugs instantly nine weeks ago. And um, it's a miracle story in which uh, his body rejected heroin. He was trying to shoot heroin and it shot it out and God spoke to him and said, you're done. You will never do this again. And um, so he, he's a, a guy that got delivered out of, <clears throat> delivered out of gangs and he's still, uh, he's been in prison a long time and uh, he calls Zach the general. <laughs> And um, he got baptized this morning. He led a guy to the Lord named Tony. Tony's a white dude. Uh, he, has a, he has a tattoo so big of Hitler that it covers his entire back. And it's Hitler with a Heil Hitler salute. 
And all over his body, he has tattoos of uh, swastikas. He's a former Aryan white supremacist. Wow. Yeah. And now he hugs black brothers and Mexican brothers and white brothers. Uh, this is a big deal. He got baptized this morning. And this morning, Eric got baptized, got saved three weeks ago. Eddie got baptized, got saved two weeks ago. And this morning, David's cell, uh, David, Zach's cellmate, David, who got taken out of his cell three weeks ago. Zach lived with him for, uh, for weeks, for months. And he was so close to getting saved, but he never would, he never would. And this morning, out on the prison yard, he saw guys getting baptized, and he came walking all the way across the yard, and he said, Zach, I want to get baptized too. I want to follow Jesus Christ as my Savior. Isn't that awesome? So, um, be praying for us because we, we're trying. We have made application to do ministry out there, but now I'm beginning to wonder what kind of ministry could we possibly do that isn't already being done, but God's doing amazing, amazing things. Hey, we're going to dismiss Little People's Church right now. This is three, four, and five misfits and miscalculations. Um, by the way, thank you, Pastor John, for speaking last week. Man, he's, he is, you guys, we're blessed. He's an incredible teaching pastor. Truly is. I mean, I, I honestly, I, I learned so much from his message, and I thought to myself, if I were a pastor, I wouldn't want to go hear John speak. I mean, I'm serious about that. In fact, maybe we need to have him do more here and me less. I mean, he is a, a great, great blessing to our church, and so many people who worked hard to make it happen last week while we were out of town. Just a great blessing. Um, if you haven't found out yet, if you're new to Buckeye First Assembly, um, you joined a group of misfits, oddballs, people whose lives have been a mess and a wreck, and Jesus rescued us. I mean, that's basically who we are, in a nutshell. Our lives were just a mess, and Jesus rescued us. And the important thing that I want to get across this morning is about our identity being grounded in Jesus Christ. If you have embraced faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're very serious about your walk with Him, your identity is in Him. You identify in Him in everything you do in every part of your life. The message this morning is titled, What's the Use? What's the use? Raise your hand if you ever said, what's the use? I mean, come on, be real with me. We believe in getting real. You don't have to, you know, put on airs and pretend. What's the use? Um, this morning we're looking at a guy who was a misfit. He was an oddball. Um, in current terminology, we would say he was a big fail. He did not measure up, mistake after mistake, and yet, like we've heard in each part of this series over and over, God delights to take individuals who are misfits and make them into success stories. Amen. He delights to do that. And this guy that we're talking about this morning is no different. Now, I don't want to scare you. I know we've got Harvest America this afternoon and all that. But in order to effectively preach this message, I need to read approximately 75% of one entire book of the Bible. And uh, are you okay with that? Okay, all right. I am kind of joking with you. Um, it is an entire book of the Bible, the book of Philemon, but it's only one chapter and it's 25 verses long. Uh, Philemon, let me just set up the story for you. Philemon is a, a guy who's a leader in a church, probably a house church. He may have been given some sense of direction and guidance. He was possibly even um, a local leader. Uh, the, the terms in the Bible like elder, deacon, um, were still very much being developed even in that first century. And, and depending on different settings in the Bible, they have different nomenclature. And he may have been called an elder. He 
He might have had what we would call um, board leadership responsibilities in today's terminology. He was a leader in this house church. Philemon had this guy who used to be his slave. The slave's name was Onesimus. First off, it should bother you what I just said, right? What do you mean he had a, a slave? Uh, well, you need to know that slavery in the first century was not like slavery here in the United States, that dark blot on our history in the antebellum South, the horrors that happened called slavery. It was not that way. Uh, it was more like being an indentured servant. Um, in fact, archaeology has uncovered writings that talk about slaves who were dentists, for instance. Slaves who were, uh, one instance, a, a slave who was an accountant. And so it's not really accurate. You could almost, when you look at slavery in the Bible, you could almost say, instead of the word slave, let's use the word employee. But it doesn't quite translate that way. And, and so slavery was different then than it is now. But uh, Philemon, a church leader, had a slave named Onesimus. And Onesimus abandoned ship. He, he jumped ship. He, he, that is to say, he left. He, he stole from Philemon. He, we, we, a lot of speculation. We're not sure all the details. He owed money to Philemon. And he ran from him. And he ran from God. But he happened to land in the same prison with this guy named Saul who had just recently named, changed his name to Paul. God actually changed his name for him. Can you imagine? You're trying to get away from God. You're running from God and then maybe he even becomes a celly with the Apostle Paul. I mean, it, God's sense of humor sometimes is amazing. And so, so what happened was, you, you're probably ahead of the story, but Paul leads Onesimus to Jesus. He gets saved. And Paul disciples Onesimus. And now it comes time, Paul says, you know what, Onesimus, you've got to go back to Philemon. You can't let this rest. You've got to go back and you've got to make good. You've got to square this stuff. What? You can't leave all of this baggage just dangling. You need to go back. I can just imagine their conversations. Oh, but Paul, if I do that, he's going to be so ticked at me. He's going to be angry. Uh, why? I owe him. And, and he's, he's going to be harsh to me. And Paul says, here's what I'll do. I'll write a letter. And I'll send it with you. You, you could almost think of it as a signed affidavit from a respected lawyer. And Paul writes to Philemon, and we get to eavesdrop. We get to read this private affidavit. It's a letter from Paul to Philemon about Onesimus. Read with me, uh, beginning at verse number 4. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than it is as none other than Paul, here's a little parenthesis, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. It is none other than Paul that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Paul writing to Philemon about Odysseus. This guy used to be a waste, but now he's useful. Here's our first point this morning. You used to be useless. Look at your neighbor and say, you used to be useless. I mean, is that true or not? It, if you're talking about 99% of us in the, in the room, 
Here's the deal. The Bible uses language like this. Both Ephesians and Colossians, it says, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. That, that's who, that's us before we come to Christ. Just dead, just no purpose, no meaning. Uh, there's one place where Paul even says, not many of you were wise by worldly standards. I mean, that's, that's this right here. That's Buckeye First Assembly. We are just, we're a hodgepodge of a bunch of people who, just a ragtag bunch of people who God has forgiven and he, He's being gracious to us and we're serving Him and we're learning more about Him all along this journey. Now, I think that probably this, this phrase here is not quite right because after I think about it, you used to be useless. I think that is true about every one of us before we came to Christ, but here's the other part of that. I want to insert one more little word in your point there. You used to be called useless. You used to be called useless. In other words, here's what I know about you. That God made human beings in His likeness. Adam and Eve, our great, 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 great grandparents, they sinned horribly. Sin entered into the world. It changed the playing field for all of us, for all time. Sin entered into the world. It was a game changer. And all of the human race is cursed under Adam. But here's the thing about it. God didn't make humans sinful. We chose sin, and sin leads us away from God. God doesn't make junk. God made humans in His likeness. And so, some of you, you've been called useless. Some of you in this room, you've been called loser. Some of you in this room have been called a waste of skin. And if you start to believe what people tell you, then you will buy into that and it will send you spiraling down, down, down. But you need to know that before creation, God chose you. He, he envisioned a plan of salvation in which if you choose to follow Him, He will receive you and no matter who you are, the slate will be wiped clean. Next week, on Father's Day, we're going to be celebrating dads in a big way. And I cannot wait to, you, to do this last message in this series called Misfits because you're going to be amazed at next week's message about a dad and about misfits and miscalculations. But let me just give you enough to whet your appetite. God loves the human race and He is gracious to the human race and He found a way to redeem the human race. So maybe you've been called no good, no count, worthless. Don't believe that. All you need is to embrace a living faith in Jesus Christ and give your heart to Him and serve Him. And He, he will rescue you. He will make something beautiful out of your life. The entire point of our life is to get us out of Adam and into Christ. Now, I'm using phrasing from the Bible to, to get delivered out of an identity with sin and rebellion and to come into an identity in which we relate with Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has redeemed us, who has purchased our, our salvation by dying on the cross for her sins. And when you are in Christ, then brother, you're no longer useless. Here's, here's the amazing thing. The name Onesimus, it means useful. In fact, Paul is using a play on words. Paul writes back to his old boss, his own his old master, and he says, He used to be useless, but I find him useful. Yes, Onesimus is useful. And if you could see it in the original language, it's such a play on words as he's redeeming. You're not useless. You're useful, Onesimus. Everyone in this room, you are an Onesimus. You are useful. 
So the, the main thing is that we've got to identify with Him. And I, I want you to hear this. Your identity is in Christ. It is not in what you do. It is in who you are. A lot of us will say, you know, someone says, tell me about yourself. Well, I'm the pastor of a church. Well, that's what I do. But that's not who I am. Who I am is a, a follower of Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, I work at the power plant, or I'm an electrician, or I drive a truck, or I'm in the armed services, or I'm a plumber. No, no, no. That's not who you are. That's, that's just what you do. But who you are is you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And all the rest of it is just how it works out and how you live it out. The story goes that John F. Kennedy went to visit NASA uh, in the early part of the 1960s before his assassination, and he boldly said, we will be the first space program to reach the moon. We will land a man on the moon. One day he went to NASA to visit them, see how things were going, just get an update. As he's walking along, there was a janitor sweeping the floor. And... The president walks up to him and maybe not having rehearsed his words, just making conversation, he, he stuck out his hand, shook his hand and says, now, now what do you do here? And he said, Mr. President, I am helping to get a man on the moon. See, here's a person who understood. It's not about what I'm doing. It's about the big picture. And, um, you know, the astronauts, I... I shook hands with Buzz Aldrin, the second guy to step on the moon, to have a book signed by him. That was a special moment for me. But don't you know, that's not going to happen unless you have somebody who's willing to pick up a broom and keep the place clean. And so the church, we must understand, we've all got different ways, different methods, different roles. And my dad, I think, um, Andy, our dad was just a special man. And he understood how important it is to value every individual, no matter what they do in life. I'll never forget this. Um, is actually my brother Jamie. Uh, he shares the story, but in the middle of the night, Dad had been in the hospital battling cancer. That um, it, This is a short version. It, it was over many months. He ended up dying from cancer, but there were many miracles along the way, like the time when he was told, you'll die in two weeks. And he looked in the doctor's eyes and said, well, doctor, I want to thank you for the fine care you've given me. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And tomorrow, if I should see that day, that will be the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. They wept together. Him and this beautiful doctor, a little short man from India, brilliant doctor, my dad, a country preacher, and they, they were friends, man, they hit it off. And he, in that day, um, Dad went home expecting to die, only he didn't die. He said, I think I'd like some pizza. <laughs> and he and the doctor said, if he wants pizza, let him have pizza. And the short story is that he, God healed him. It was a miracle of healing. He, he got up, he got his strength. He went around preaching all over East Texas, sharing the miracle of healing. And uh, enjoyed Thanksgiving with family, enjoyed Christmas with family, um, had special occasions with family. And, um, and then my mom and him celebrated their anniversary on January 26th. And on January 27th, he, he said, I need to go back to the doctor, something's not right. And on March 18th, he went home to be with the Lord. But backpedal to this, this scene. My brother is at 3 a.m. sitting with my dad in the hospital room, dad is wiped out from having uh, chemo and, and he's, he's received radiation. And at three in the morning, my brother wakes up to this scene. There's a janitor coming in the room and he's kind of quietly going around picking up trash in the dim light and he's unloading the trash can. And Jamie thought my dad was asleep but he heard Dad say, Freddie, is that you? Yes, sir, Pastor, it's me. 
Oh, Freddie, I love you. I love you too, Pastor. Freddie was just one guy that Dad touched in the hospital. There's another guy named Alan that would come all the way from the other side of this huge hospital to visit him every time he worked because God just restored him. And the last time he came in, he had a he had a, a airline ticket in his pocket. He said, Pastor, you know what this is? What's that, Alan? This is my airline ticket to go visit my dad. He had been estranged from his dad for 11 years. They hadn't spoken. But dad ministered to him. He said, you really need to go see your dad and make things right. And here was the airline ticket in his pocket. Everybody, everybody matters. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or as Beethoven composed music or as Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Let's read on. Philemon verse 12 is chapter 1. The only chapter. Verse 12, Paul writes, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he would take your place in helping me while I am here in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you did, that any favor that you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason... He was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. I love the way Paul, he, he's, a, he's a crafty guy. <laughs> I don't want to do anything too authoritarian. I don't want to pull rank on you, Philemon, and tell you what you should do. I'd rather you decide to do it on your own. And I'm just sending you this nice little note to suggest that. <laughs> and just think about how what's going on here. Paul has already said, I'm sending him who is my own heart. Paul has said about Philemon, uh, about, rather about Onesimus, who is this runaway slave who is now a prisoner. Paul says about Onesimus, I became his father while he was in prison. And then he, he comes right around and he, he says, he uses the language of brother. He said, now Philemon, you're going to receive Onesimus back and he's not going to be just as a fellow man, but as a brother in the Lord. Uh, Paul says, he's my very own heart. My own heart. Here's the second point this morning. Failures make good family members. Failures make good family members. If, if you want to impact Buckeye, then, and I, I think you do. I mean, I think we do, right? Am I, am I right when I assume that we want all of Buckeye saved and serving Jesus? Uh, would it be too presumptive to assume that we would love to fill this place up multiple times on a Sunday with people getting saved, finding that Jesus is the answer they've been looking for? Yes. So if we want to do that, church, then this is a very important series of messages. We are misfits, and we are welcoming misfits. We kind of have to do like General Norman Schwarzkopf did. He learned as a little boy, 10 years old, the gag reflex. You got to control the gag reflex. You see, his dad was an ambassador to Saudi Arabia. And little Norman went on a trip with him to Saudi Arabia. And as they were going through different villages, they came to this one Bedouin community with large tents. And the chief invited them into his tent for a meal. And when they walk in, that day they served camel. And it was roasted camel, and uh, it was very much still intact with the hump and the head. And the, the chief took a liking to little Norman immediately. Boy, they just, he liked him, and they were kind of, you know, 
jawing back and forth, just enjoying one another's company. And as an honor to this little boy, he gave him the most prized possession of the camel. He popped the eyeball out and put it on his plate. I think I just cured the crowd that wanted to get to the restaurant, right? And little Norman knew. He knew he didn't even make eye contact with his dad. He knew, I've got to find a way to get this down. And what did he do? He, he put it in his mouth and one big gulp, he swallowed that thing whole. I didn't, and I'm amazed. I don't know how big a camel eye is. I know a horse eye is gigantic. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm not fond of eating food that can look back at me. I don't know about you. But the, I guess that's probably stretching it. But spiritually speaking, when, when you encounter people who have been beat up by this world and they've been engaged in every kind of sinful behavior, sometimes there's a little bit of a gag reflex and you think, oh, I don't know. And we can become standoffish. But God wants us to embrace people. Listen to the names of some of the people who failed miserably. Henry Ford, F.W. Woolworth, uh, Sochiro Honda. You might, not name the, you might not know the name Akio Morito, but you know his company, Sony. Um, the first product they produced was a rice cooker that burned rice. <laughs> Um, Bill Gates was a dropout from Harvard. A guy named Hartland David Sanders um, had his chicken recipe rejected 1,009 times before finally it landed a deal, and that's the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Walt Disney was told by a newspaper editor that he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. <laughs> Albert Einstein. He was um, seven years old. He was causing trouble with his teachers. He didn't learn to speak until he was four. And his parents at age seven thought he was mentally handicapped. Um, Socrates, you may know from philosophy, um, he, he left no written records. Um, he was regarded as one of the great philosophers of the classical era. Um, because of his new ideas, he was called an immoral corrupter of youth. He was sentenced to death, and yet one of the great minds in history. Um, what about some of these in, the inventions of Thomas Edison, for instance? Edison, in his early years, was told, quote, he was too stupid to learn anything. Thomas Edison, too stupid to learn anything. Um, Winston Churchill struggled in school and he failed the sixth grade. Abraham Lincoln uh, went off to war as a young captain and he returned as a private. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, see my daughter-in-law after church. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey um, was, had several career setbacks and uh, our, her, her, tele, her first television job as a reporter, she was told by her producer that she was, quote, unfit for TV. Oprah. Now, I mean, you could go through all of these, like Jerry Seinfeld, um, the first time he went on stage, got stage fright and locked up, and the people started hissing and booing. And he walked off. The stage ducked his head. Fred Astaire <laughs> was told by MGM uh, the, the written note about his performance. He can't act and he can't sing. He's slightly bald and he can only dance a little. Oh, um, Elvis Presley was told by his manager, you ain't going nowhere. You ought to go back to driving a truck. There's 50 of these. It's an amazing article about all of these failures who, who really made great successes. I can't help but wonder, in Buckeye, who is out there that's been told, you know what, you're nothing but a loser. You're not smart. 
you bozo, you're never going to amount to anything. And all they need is someone to share Jesus with them and say, we just want you to come journey with us. You know what? You are valuable. You were made in the image of God. You were meant to succeed. And God loves you and He cares about you. And I want to finish reading Philemon chapter 1. Uh, before this sermon gets too long, you might really think, man, we really are reading an entire book of the Bible this morning. Verse 17 Paul says to Philemon, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him. Welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. There goes Paul again being Paul. You know, not to mention you owe me your life. I mean, that, that's all. <laughs> I do wish, verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do this amazing letter from the authority of the apostle suggesting that Onesimus should be treated fairly. And by the way, do you notice some of, the, some of the things in this paragraph? It's just like the story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan. Do you notice that? Do you catch that? I'll pay for him. If he owes anything, add it to, put it on my bill. I'll take care of it. Uh, Paul even says, that he, he identifies with him. He says, welcome him the same way that you would welcome me. I mean, if, if you would say, oh, Paul, come on in here. You're in town. Could you preach this Sunday? We want you to stay at, stay at the finest hotel. We've got food for you. Come, apostle. Bless us. Paul's saying, would you treat this runaway slave turned follower of Christ the same exact way as you would treat me? And it beckons this third point, which is this. My role in rolling out the welcome wagon. My role in rolling out the welcome wagon. What is my role in that? Um, the Cambridge Dictionary says that the welcome wagon is defined this way. It refers to a happy and friendly way of greeting people who are new to a place. Um, for instance, she really likes to roll out the welcome wagon. Uh, the Free Dictionary says that it was literally a wheeled vehicle in the Old West as people came into town that they would gather information and gifts from local merchants and they would give it to people that were new to town. That was the welcome wagon. I want you to just ask yourself right now, what is my role on the welcome wagon? How can I, as a member of Buckeye First Assembly, make sure that when people come to our church, they are absolutely welcomed? I mean, what could you come up with? What would you do? We need people. We need, we need greeters out, more, out front. More than one on Sunday morning. I'm thankful for the team. We've got Pete, we've got Mike, we've got, I, I shouldn't have started, we've got people who greet, and they do an amazing job. But we need a team out there. We actually need parking lot attendants with the doors open, greeting people. Can I help you out of your car? Is there anything I could get for you? We need, we need volunteers for our usher team to, to be able to do way more than just in this room, but out in, in the main lobby to greet people and say, I just want to tag along. And just Is there anything at all that you need? Do you know, we need children's volunteers right now. And we've got, our children's ministry is growing. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, on Sunday mornings, this room is getting comfortable, full. They say 80% is full. A lot of times we have more than what is in here today. Sometimes we have less. But did you, you may not know this, but this room, we're okay. I mean, we've got places for people to sit. But if you were to go back to the nursery, 
If you were to go upstairs to our children's ministry, uh, Little People's Church, BFA Lights, all three of those ministries are maxed out. We need volunteers to say, I'll help in the nursery. I will love babies. And Stephanie doesn't talk about this a lot, but she would love for a lady to just have the heart for three, four, and five-year-olds and to just take that ministry. We have amazing ministry that happens for those kids. All the stuff is supplied. We need volunteers. One thing we need on Wednesday nights, I have begun praying for our Royal Rangers and Impact Club people to just explode. It's great. But we want, we want to offer all the different age level clubs. We need volunteers. If you're interested in a program that is amazing for men, it has blessed me to see Pete mentoring. Just very recently, one of our guys saying, hey, come along, here's how you do this. I want you, if you're interested, to go see him and say, teach me, train me, how can I do this? If you're a lady and you say, I would like to pour into our children, I'd love, I would love for us to have all of these classes you're talking about, the different clubs for our girls. If you're interested, come see me. We'll get you locked in. And, and those are things that will help us really roll out the welcome wagon. I believe probably that even while I'm talking, the Holy Spirit is is saying things to individuals, different things that you would say, you know, I've always hoped that our church would have thus and such. Maybe God's calling you to that ministry. Roll out that welcome wagon. Now here's the here's the takeaway this morning, and I always when I when I do this, what I mean is what's the main thing that I would like us to take away from this sermon today? And this is it. Don't ever get used to being useful. Remember that useful is the name of the guy that we talked about this morning. Onesimus. Don't ever get used to being useful. I remember um, a slogan that I heard from the Houston Rockets. I was big time Rockets fan in the early 90s. They, they repeated back to back NBA champs. And uh, by the way, I, just for what it's worth, I'm pretty excited about Golden State. I love that team. And I, I just think there's no way the Cavs are going to beat them three times in a row. It's just I, I, if you bear, if you, you know, if you'd like to differ with me on that, we can talk out in the lobby afterwards. I really, I really love watching that team. I remember the slogan, though, of Houston Rockets in the early 90s. And I thought, you know, that's an amazing statement. This is something that we as a church family need to embrace. Their slogan was, stay humble and stay hungry. Stay humble and stay hungry. I, I hope that we never quite get used to that feeling of being useful. I hope that in some sense, we can always feel a little bit like Onesimus must have felt carrying this authorized letter from the Apostle Paul back to his former boss, explaining, I know I made mistakes, I know I did things wrong, but I'm a different person now, and this letter is a signed affidavit that says, I'm a new individual, give me another chance, let me make it good. What would that feel like to go from being useless to useful? Stay humble. Stay hungry. I want you to bow your heads with me and let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, You are truly, truly amazing, Lord. The mystery of salvation just just blows us away. We are so amazed by you. And we're amazed by your plan. We are amazed, Lord Jesus, that you laid aside all of the splendor and the beauty of heaven, all of the 
the glory and the mystery, all of the wonder of heaven. Like Nick was saying earlier, you, you came you came to this earth to live life from our point of view. You came knowing that your mission would be to die on that cross. And you rescued us. Lord, today we're remembering that there's a lot of people that are Onesimus all around us in our city. Lead us to them. Crisscross our paths with them. Help us to continually be inviting and, and sharing and uh, helping people to find their purpose. Just like Pete was saying, that we teach people to find purpose in Christ and, and we share that. We, we don't hold on to it. We, we want to share and we want to reach our community for you. Help us to be overwhelmed and overcome by love for the lost. Teach us to stay hungry. Teach us to stay humble. Lord, as we're leaving this place today, we really especially pray your blessings upon this beautiful outreach that is happening tonight, this afternoon, at University of Phoenix Stadium. Father, we are praying that thousands of lives are changed for your glory. We, we have prayed, we have cried out to you for weeks and weeks, every day, asking for your blessings. Even when we leave here today, don't let us forget, there might be someone that you lead us to even today, and we invite them to go with us. Oh, Father, we pray your blessings upon it, and we, we just ask that you would receive glory for it. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen and amen. amen. Hey, stand to your feet. I want you to just take some time and just enjoy.